So in this presentation, we're going to talk about the formation of climate um, around the globe. Um, climate is created by uh, the unequal heating of the earth, by air currents, and by ocean currents. Some you guys already know about biomes. We've talked about biomes a lot. Um, you started, you know, you started those in the fifth grade. You saw them again in middle school, and then you've had them in. Um, biology as well, but you may or may not know how those biomes are formed. You can't just kind of take them for granted. Not in apes. In apes, you're going to learn how the biomes are formed and why they are where they are. So the first thing to note is that Earth's atmosphere is layered. There are five, gas, five layers of gases that surround the Earth. Gravity actually keeps the gases in place. Gas has mass, and you already know that, obviously. I hope you know that that the layers closest to Earth have a greater mass than the layers above. The layers closer to Earth are, have more densely packed molecules, which also causes higher air pressure. And all this is going to come into play when we talk about the characteristics of each of these layers. Okay, if, if you take a look at this diagram, the diagram is... Um, hopefully obvious. It's the layers of the atmosphere. There's a lot going on in the diagram, so we're going to kind of take it piece by piece here. If you look down along the bottom, and I always do this, I move it instead of uh, worrying on it. Down here on this bottom part, you've got temperature in degrees centigrade, uh, and the temperature ranges from negative 100 to 2,000 degrees. Um, obviously at the surface that there's only a small uh, variation in temperature there, but as you get into the upper atmosphere, into the exosphere, you're going to need uh, that wider scale. Along the um, right-hand side here, you kind of got the major um, things that are happening in each one of these layers. So for instance, here in the troposphere at the surface, they tell you that this is where you find life forms. Okay. In the stratosphere, they point out where the ozone layer is and tell you that 24% of the atmosphere occurs between that ozone layer and the surface of the Earth. And then as we go up, you see the mesosphere, shooting stars burn up here, large temperature fluctuations are here, satellites float around in the upper thermosphere and all that groovy stuff. Once you get to the exosphere, anything uh, above the exosphere is outer space. Um, the, there are still obviously air molecules out there, but they're so far apart that they're not really considered an atmospheric layer. And we're going to get into um, kind of in terms of in each one of these layers, what is important for the APES exam. Um, each one of these layers, this is the troposphere down here. I'm, again, I'm starting at the surface of the Earth. Each one of these layers is capped by something called a pause. So the troposphere is capped by the tropopause. The stratosphere is capped by the stratopause, and the mesos mesosphere is capped by the mesopause. Now, because the um, thermosphere and the exosphere kind of blend into each other and the exosphere blends into outer space, they don't really have those same caps there. Um, but that's, that's what these, these pauses are here. Uh, not that that's super important for apes, but you may see that terminology on the exam. Uh, let's take a look at the temperature line. The temperature line is this red squiggly line that goes from the surface and you watch it. I'm going to just kind of mimic it with my pointer here. This is what it does. It kind of looks like a zigzag. So we're going to talk more about these temperature inversions as we talk about what's going on in each one of these layers. But um, just to let you know, the troposphere, um, as we go higher in altitude, so as we go upwards, the troposphere gets colder. And you can see that on this diagram. Um, we're starting, let's see, a little, little above zero. And remember that this is average surface temperature. So they're taking every temperature on the surface of the planet and they're mapping that out. So let's just say, it looks like the red line starts about, eh, we're going to say it starts about 10 degrees. And remember, this is centigrade. Um, on average, we'll say the surface of the, the Earth is about 10 degrees centigrade. As you go higher, you, you notice that you drop to negative 52 degrees centigrade at the top of the troposphere. Um, right there by the tropopause, you get to negative 52 degrees centigrade. So we say with altitude, the troposphere gets colder. The stratosphere actually has a temperature inversion. 
So um, the stratosphere, for the first little bit of it, before we hit the ozone layer, it actually gets colder. And this diagram does a really poor job of showing that. Um, I'm going to show, I'm going to talk to you about that in the slide. The lower part of the stratosphere, right above the tropopause, actually continues getting colder with altitude. But as soon as you hit the ozone layer, you have a temperature inversion where you actually get warmer with altitude. And there's a reason for that, and that reason is ultraviolet radiation. I'm going to talk more about that in the next few slides. The mesosphere then again gets colder with altitude, and the thermosphere on up into outer space gets warmer with altitude. And all this has to do with incoming solar radiation and what's blocked in what layers, okay? So uh, you'll see another picture of this in your textbooks, so don't get too hung up on it here. But um, you, I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to know about each layer. So the layer closest to the Earth is called the troposphere. You saw that on the last slide. It's the densest layer, and it's where most of the nitrogen, oxygen, and water vapor that are current our atmosphere, it's where they're mostly found. There is extensive vertical, that means up and down, and horizontal mixing of liquids and gases within the troposphere. This is important, all right? Um, the water vapor is primarily, water and water vapor is what we're talking about when we're talking about liquids. But gases, um, gases also have extensive vertical and horizontal mixing within the troposphere. Um, this has to do, this is going to be important when we talk about air pollution. Uh, this is going to be important when we talk about weather. So all of Earth's weather occurs here, 100% of it. No weather occurs in any other layer but the troposphere. All of life on Earth occurs here. This is where life is found, in this first layer uh, closest to the surface. And as I mentioned before, the temperature of the troposphere decreases with increasing altitude. Above the troposphere is the layer called the stratosphere. The stratosphere is less dense than the troposphere because it's further away from the surface. The ozone layer is found here. The chemical formula for ozone is O3. That is one that you need to know. It's a uh, um, triple bonded oxygen. And if you know anything about chemistry, which you should, you will know that oxygen is a diatomic molecule. That means it likes to hang out in pairs in O2 formation. O3, ozone, is highly unstable. And uh, the reason that it's for, found in the, in the stratosphere in abundance is because ultraviolet radiation uh, knocks an, o, an oxygen molecule off of diatomic oxygen. And when it does that, oxygen is a free radical. It, it creates a short-lived ozone molecule. So ozone in the stratosphere is constantly broken down because, again, oxygen wants to hang out in pairs, not in threes. And then when the ultraviolet radiation from the sun hits it, we've got a free radical being created. That oxygen grabs on and makes an ozone molecule that only hangs around for a little while. Then it's broken down into its diatomic state again. Then the radiation hits it, and we have an O3 molecule again. And so in the stratosphere, ozone is continually created and destroyed. This is going to get to be a real big, um, a real big point when we talk about the structure uh, of the stratospheric ozone layer. The ozone layer absorbs most of the UV, UVB and almost all of the UVC radiation coming from the sun. Um, without the, U, the ozone layer, we would all have DNA damage and there would probably be no life on Earth. So UV radiation exposure causes DNA damage. So the ozone layer is critical for the protection of life on Earth. In fact, the ozone layer, it took a while for the ozone layer to develop. Before we had abundant atmospheric oxygen, um, remember that it, it's the evolution of plants that drove um, the abundance of oxygen in the modern atmosphere. So before we had the evolution of land plants, we didn't have a whole lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. But once land plants um, evolved, we ended up, you know, oxygen's a waste gas of photosynthesis, so we ended up with a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. And when that oxygen uh, got up into the stratosphere, as it floated up into the stratosphere, ozone was formed. And once that ozone was formed, and uh, began blocking some of that incoming UV radiation, we could really have life take off on this planet. Uh, temperatures in the lower stratosphere decrease with altitude. And this is what I was saying before. So below the ozone layer, 
that can that uh, temperature decrease as we go further up into the atmosphere that inc that continues but once you hit the ozone layer above that ozone layer stratospheric temperatures increase with altitude and that has to do with that incoming solar radiation so below the ozone layer the UV radiation is largely blocked so you have the temperature being cooler above you don't have that same uh, blocking of UV radiation and so the temperature is higher Above the stratosphere are three additional layers, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, and the exosphere. Now there's not a lot about any three of uh, these three that we do in apes. Um, you just have to kind of know the overall schema of this. So pressure and density continues to decrease as we move upward to the outer edges of the atmosphere. The thermosphere helps block UV rays and UV radiation from reaching the Earth. So the thermosphere is another uh, block that we have in place. Thermosphere largely blocks UV rays and some of the incoming UV radiation. So we've got some of it blocked already before it hits the ozone layer. Uh, the other thing to note about the thermosphere is it contains the charged gas molecules that glow when hit by solar radiation. Um, this gives us the aurora borealis, which is what it's called in the northern hemisphere, that's the northern lights, and the aurora australis, which uh, is the southern lights in the southern hemisphere. I've got a picture of them for you. Here, here's a picture. This is the Northern Lights, and they are just that spectacular. So what this is, is charged gas particles um, that are releasing their radiation, they're, they're, they're glowing, they're releasing their light energy. Um, they were hit by solar radiation during the daytime, and, at, and they, the molecules get excited, and as they fall down back into their normal uh, states, they emit light energy. This is a, a picture that was taken over Alaska, and um, I have seen the Aurora Borealis, and it is absolutely incredible. And this display that I saw was nothing like this, but I have seen, I know people who have taken pictures just like this. So this is it's pretty cool stuff, and um, it's atmospheric physics. Yay, science. Okay, so the surface of the Earth is heated unevenly by the sun. So the sun's beating down on the earth. Uh, well, you know, the earth has a lot of features and it's also a sphere. So um, it, the, the surface is, is gonna get heated unevenly. Well, there's three primary causes for this. The first is the angle at which the sun's rays strike the earth. Okay, now bear with me because there's a whole bunch going on here. In areas that are nearest the equator, the sun's rays strike nearly perpendicular to the surface of the earth, okay? In the mid-latitudes, and particularly at the poles, the rays strike at more oblique angles. And I'm gonna draw a little picture here, and y'all know that I'm no artist, right? Okay, so let's pretend this is the Earth. Okay, here's our little equator as we go across, right? There's our equator. So the sun is really, really large, and so if we were to kind of compare the Earth and the sun, the sun would be larger than I can draw here. But let's pretend this is our incoming solar radiation. Here we go. This is our incoming solar radiation. Obviously, hopefully you can understand that the sun is to the left on this diagram. So as the solar radiation um, is coming from the sun, at the equator, if you, uh, and I want you to think of this in your mind in this, in this way. I want you to think of a basketball and a flashlight. Picture a basketball and a flashlight in your mind. If you shine that flashlight straight on to that spherical basketball, you're gonna get a concentrated circle of light wherever you shine it, okay? But the basketball is a sphere, as is the Earth. So as <clears throat> that same incoming light, now remember, it's coming in all through here. So as you look at the angle that light comes in here and the angle that the light comes in here, you end up with a more oblong, a more oval-shaped, light path right here in the mid latitudes and, and i'm a terrible drawer and y'all can appreciate that and then here in the poles it's a very very oblique angle okay so again as it's coming on this is the equator is going to be where your direct light hits and in the mid latitudes you get more of an oval shaped or a more oblique angle and at the poles it's very oval shaped and very oblique wow that's a bad drawing i'm hoping that you're getting that we're going to talk about it in class as well so 
Think about it like this. Because of this, the sunlight at the equator is traveling through less of Earth's atmosphere and less energy is getting lost, right? So you're going straight through, straight through at, at a very direct angle through the layers of the atmosphere. But as you move away from the equator, the sunlight has to travel through increasing amounts of the atmosphere because it's coming in at a lower angle. It's coming in at a more oblique angle. And so as you pass through more of the atmosphere, more of your radiant energy is lost. Okay, you're passing through a greater amount of the atmosphere before you hit the surface. Okay, so that's the first cause, the angle at which the sun's rays strike the earth. Here we go, on to number two. Number two the amount of surface area over which the rays are distributed. Now, again, uh, this goes along with number one. Number one is the angle. Number two is the surface area. So um, take a look at this picture. It's kind of what I was trying to draw on the other slide. Um, hopefully successfully, but I'm not sure. So when the sun's rays strike near the equator, the solar energy is more direct. That is, it's distributed over a smaller area than at the Earth's poles. Because of this, the regions at the equator receive more solar energy per square meter than those at the poles. So again, we've got direct path, uh, solar radiation coming in a direct path here at the equator, and a more oblique path at both the northern and the southern poles, and you know, varying oblique path in the mid-latitudes there. Um, there's two things going on. The angle is lower, the angle is more oblique, so the, the UV radiation is having to pass through more atmosphere, so it's already losing more of its um, heat energy and its energy, uh, radiant and heat energy. And then at the poles down here, um, because that already diminished energy is having to be spread out over a greater surface area, because the Earth is a sphere, you are getting less what they call insolation. And this is a new word for you, probably. This is the word, insulation, okay? You're getting less insulation per square meter, um, and that is because of that low angle that the um, that this oblique sunlight's having to come in at, and not insulation, but insolation. That's, that's the amount of incoming sunlight. That's what that word means, okay? So number one and number two are, are really are linked together. The third reason is that the Earth has differences in albedo. Um, albedo is probably a new word for you as well. Albedo is the percentage of incoming sunlight that's reflected off a surface. You guys already know that um, darker surfaces absorb more sunlight, lighter surfaces reflect more. So let's talk about that in terms of the Earth systems. The higher the albedo of a surface, the more solar energy it reflects and the less it absorbs. So a white surface has a higher albedo than a black surface. Lighter areas of the planet, like those that are covered by ice and snow, such as the poles, tend to reflect more solar energy and they stay cooler. Darker areas like open ocean or tropical regions with dense dark green foliage absorb more solar energy and they stay warmer. Okay, so the poles have an average albedo of between 80 and 95%. And tropical regions that have that dense dark green foliage have an average albedo of 10 to 20%. The overall average albedo of Earth is 30%. That's a little factoid. Sometimes they ask about um, overall albedo of the Earth. It's not very frequent though. Um, so when we're talking about albedo, one of the things we'll talk about is... Um, the albedo of the poles and how that's changing. Um, with air pollution, when we put when we burn fossil fuels, we end up with particulates in the air. Um, particulates are those little black sooty pieces that um, come out come out of smokestacks when we burn particularly coal. And as that stuff floats up through the atmosphere, uh, because we have a lot of vertical and horizontal mixing of the troposphere, as you've already learned, um, eventually that stuff settles out and it often settles out in the North and South Pole. Well, what happens when you sprinkle black dust on a white surface? Well, it makes the surface a lot less white. What we know about albedo is that the darker the surface, the more solar radiation it absorbs. So when you take a bright white surface like a glacier or an ice sheet and you sprinkle it with uh, pieces of carbon, that's what that basically is, that sooty carbon, it darkens it. So when you have air pollution that deposits on glaciers and they get darker, they absorb more solar radiation. Um, this is part of a positive feedback loop because uh, the increased air temperatures are already causing glacial melt. Uh, the increased air pollution depositing on the glaciers, you end up with darker glaciers and this increases uh, the rate of glacial melt. Uh, there's all kinds of 
um, schemes that people are trying to come up with to shield the glaciers from having these um, carbon, these sooty carbon deposits uh, get on them. So far, nothing has been successful, but um, this is an example. You guys learned about positive and negative feedback loops, and this is an example of part of a positive Arctic feedback loop. So the Earth's axis is tilted at 23.5 degrees off of true north. Um, so if you were picturing uh, the Earth as a sphere, the North Pole is not straight up and down. It's tilted at 23.5 degrees off of true north. Due to this tilt, the Earth's orbit around the sun causes most regions of the world to experience uh, seasonal changes in temperature and precipitation. So the, at, the Earth's tilt is the reason that we have seasons, except in the, at the equator where there are no seasons because that's not affected by tilt. When the Northern Hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere and winter in the Southern Hemisphere. When the Southern Hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, it's summer in the Southern Hemisphere and winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And I'm gonna show you a diagram of this so don't freak out. Um, the thing that always freak, that freaks me out actually, I have Australian friends and they always think that Christmas day is an excellent time to have a barbecue on the beach because Christmas happens in the middle of the Australian summer. It still obviously happens on December 25th. The calendar doesn't change, but December 25th is the middle of the Australian summer. So they're uh, surfing and having uh, barbecues on the beach at that day while we are um, eating Thanksgiving turkey and ham and freezing. Okay, so there are two equinoxes. There's a vernal equinox um, and we, we, here in the United States, we, we usually refer to it as a vernal or autumnal. Um, the rest of the world sometimes says March and September, and here's why. As I told you, the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, um, the seasons are flipped. So if you say vernal equinox to an Australian, that means something completely different than it does to a North American. So it's much clearer to say the March equinox or the September equinox. So I'm gonna stick with the scientific terms, the March equinox. Uh, the sun is directly overhead at the equator. All regions of Earth receive 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness. Uh, the March equinox marks the spring, the beginning of spring in the Northern Hemisphere, and the beginning of fall in the Southern Hemisphere. So again, we think of March as a spring month because we're from North, uh, from North America. So um, on the March equinox, this is when our spring begins, but in the Southern Hemisphere, March begins their fall. The September or the autumnal equinox happens in September. The sun is directly again overhead at the equator. All regions of the earth receive 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness. This is when fall begins in the northern hemisphere and spring begins in the southern hemisphere. So again, it's hard for us as North Americans to wrap our mind around the fact that spring is beginning in September because that's our fall, but south of the equator, the seasons are reversed. There are also two solstices. There's a June or summer solstice. And again, we, we need to refer to them by their month rather than their season because the seasons are reversed um, in, south, in um, uh, Southern Hemisphere. So we've got the June solstice. The June solstice, the Northern Hemisphere is maximally, maximally tilted towards the sun and it experiences the longest day of the year. This normally happens around June 20th or 21st. Um, this is the day that summer begins in the Northern Hemisphere and winter begins in the Southern Hemisphere. We also have a December solstice. This is where the Northern Hemisphere is maximally tilted away from the sun and experiences the shortest day of the year. Winter is then beginning in the Northern Hemisphere and southern, and summer is beginning in the Southern Hemisphere. So again, um, imagine that solstice has happened between the 20th and the 21st of these two months. So June 20th, 21st, December 20th, 21st, depending on the year. So again, keep that in mind when we're talking about the June solstice, um, we think of that as summer's beginning, but that's actually when winter begins in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, with the December solstice, Again, this is why Christmas Day is a great time to go to the beach in Australia because the solstice, the December solstice is beginning and it's the height of their summer. And of course, it's the height of our winter in the Northern Hemisphere. So here's the diagram that I promised if you were having trouble visualizing this. And again, there's also one in your textbook so you can uh, take a look at that. Um, this right here shows the tilting. Oops, keep doing that. Okay, let's do this. The tilting of the Earth's axis 
And some textbooks and some pictures show it tilted one way, some show it tilted the other way. It really doesn't matter. Um, it's tilted 23.5 degrees off true north. Um, and you can see the, the spin there is counterclockwise. Um, you can see the, the direction of the arrow. That's the way that the earth is spinning. And of course the seasons are the result of the tilt, right? And our day and night is the result of the spin. Just wanna make sure everybody's clear on that. You should be. So I'm gonna start with uh, right over here on the right hand side. This is the December solstice right here. Happens 20th, 21st of December. Late December, we've got Northern hemisphere begins winter, Southern hemisphere begins summer. Then as we move here to the top, We've got our spring equinox, or what we would uh, consider our March equinox up here, where everybody gets 12 hours of daylight and um, darkness. And we move down here over to this side, and we're in late June. That's our other, um, our other solstice. That would be our June solstice. So we've got our northern hemisphere summer beginning and our southern hemisphere winter beginning. And as we move down here, we have our other equinox. Um, we have our September equinox down here um, where everybody gets 12 hours of daylight and darkness. Yay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about air currents. Now we've talked about the structure of the, of the atmosphere, right? And we've talked about uh, why we have seasons. So let's talk about air currents. Air has four properties that determine how it circulates in the atmosphere its density, its saturation point, adiabatic cooling, and adiabatic heating. I know, you, you haven't heard of these before. You're about to hear about them. And latent heat release. So we're gonna go through each one of these four properties and talk about how this, how this pertains to air moving in the atmosphere. Density is first. Everybody understands what density is. Density is defined as the mass of all the air molecules in a given volume. And of course, this is for air, but you guys know what density is. It's the mass of all blank molecules in a given volume. All right, so as the sun heats the surface of the earth, the, ref the, the reflected infrared radiation, so the sun hits the surface of the earth, and some of that uh, radiation, some of that um, energy is reflected as infrared radiation, and it warms the air just above the surface of the planet. Okay, so you've got nice warm air right above the surface at the bottom of the troposphere. Warm air is less dense than cold air and less dense air rises. Everybody understands this. It even happens in your bedroom, right? Um, so you got warm air that comes goes up to the top and you got cool air that sinks down to the bottom. As the air rises into the atmosphere away from the surface, it cools down. Because remember, the troposphere gets colder as we go further up. Cooler air is more dense, and more dense air sinks back down towards the surface where the warming process begins again. So density, and that, uh, then the sun's, of course, incoming uh, energy, incoming radiation, um, causes the changes in density, which causes these convection currents to begin. Saturation point is our second uh, property of air that causes um, air, air to flow or air to move. Saturation point is the maximum amount of water vapor that air can hold at a given temperature. And if you take a look at this um, graph down here, you'll see it's an ac actually exponential. It looks like a J curve. Uh, that's right there. We're going to be talking all about, a lot about exponential and logarithmic growth this year. Yay, math. Um, warm air can hold significantly more water vapor than cold air. So the, the greater the temperature, uh, the greater its ability to hold moisture. Thus, warm air has a higher saturation point than cold air. Um, this is important. The tropics tend to, tend to be both warm and humid. Um, the reason for that is that warm air holds a lot more um, water vapor. It holds a, has a higher saturation point than cold air. Um, so anytime you get an area that has lots of incoming solar radiation, you're also going to have high humidity. Okay, adiabatic cooling and heating. Um, this is probably going to be completely new to you. So let's talk about it. Now, the processes here you should be familiar with from chemistry. Um, so let's talk about it. Adiabatic cooling and heating refers to air's response to changes in pressure. So as air rises, and I want you to look at the diagram here, I'm on this side of the diagram, right here, right? As air rises, the pressure on it decreases, okay? Because again, as we move up, into, up from the surface up to the upper reaches of the troposphere, the air pressure goes down. 
The lower pressure allows the air to expand in volume and the expansion lowers the temperature of the air. Sound like a gas law? It is. This is known as adiabatic cooling. So as the volume increases, the temperature decreases. Why? Well, it has to do with molecule collision. So the molecules now have more space to spread out and because they're not colliding as much, um, every time you have molecules colliding, it creates heat. Remember, temperature is um, and actually a measure of average kinetic motion of the molecules of a substance. So if they're not bumping into each other as much, they're not creating um, as many collisions and the temperature is actually lower. That's adiabatic cooling. That the, um, as the warm air rises, the volume decreases and the temperature decreases. Okay, conversely, now I'm on the other side of the diagram now, right here. Um, as the air sinks towards the Earth's surface, the increasing pressure causes a decrease in volume, which increases the temperature. Because again, the volume is going down, which means that those molecules are hitting each other more frequently. Every time a molecule hits, um, it hits another molecule, it creates a little bit of heat. And that is called adiabatic heating. So even though you hadn't heard those terms before, the processes behind them should make sense to you based on what you know about gases um, and the gas laws from chemistry. Okay, so latent heat release. When water vapor in the atmosphere condenses into liquid water, and you know what that's all about because you know about the water cycle, right? So water vapor in the atmosphere condenses into liquid water. When that happens, that condensation, energy is released as heat. And again, you should have learned this in chemistry. This is known as latent heat release. And it happens not just for water, but for all substances. But since we're talking about the way that air moves, we're talking about how water, um, how this relates to water. So the, um, the, as the air rises, right, it's warm air and it's holding lots of moisture. Remember, because warm air holds more moisture, its saturation point is higher. As it rises up to the top of the troposphere, it cools. As it cools, it condenses. And the, the water vapor that's in the air condenses into liquid water. Um, that, as that happens, that condensation, ener uh, energy is released as heat, and that's latent heat release. Because of this phenomenon, whenever water vapor in the atmosphere condenses, the air becomes warmer and rises in the atmosphere. So if you take a look here, you've got latent heat absorbed and latent heat released. So these are the three states of water. You've got solid, liquid, and gas. Solid starts on the left-hand side right here. Think. And we've got liquid in the middle and gas. So when we have latent heat absorbed, this means that the substance is actually getting cooler. So as ice melts into water, that actually takes energy, right? So latent heat is absorbed there. And as uh, water is evaporated into a gas, again, latent heat is absorbed there. Um, the opposite is true here. As gas is condensed into liquid, and that's what we were talking about right up here, latent heat release. Um, as the gas, the gaseous water vapor, as it condenses into liquid water, we have a release of the latent heat there. So we actually have a release of heat energy. The same is true between water and ice. We have, um, when water freezes into ice, we have latent heat release there. Um, so we've got latent heat absorbed when we go from solid to liquid to gas. We have latent heat released when we go from gas to liquid to solid ice. You guys, I, I'm hoping that as you kind of go a little bit further in this course, you see why you have to take chemistry before you take apes, because there's a whole bunch of the earth system stuff that relies on your knowledge of chemistry. And if you don't have chemistry before you take it, you're at a distinct disadvantage. So I'm hoping that you're kind of pulling in some of your, your chemistry stuff here, because this early part, um, especially with earth systems, uses a lot of what you learned in chemistry. All right. This is a kind of a weird diagram, but it actually, there's a lot going on and it's actually pretty good. Uh, the single biggest contributor to Earth's differing climates is atmospheric convection currents. Um, by the way, that's been a test question, so boop, I'm going to underline it right here. What's the single biggest contributor to Earth's differing climates? The answer is atmospheric convection currents. What are those? Well, they're, they're the global patterns of air movement that are initiated and maintained by the unequal heating of the earth. And of course, we've been talking about the unequal heating of the earth. We talked about the mechanics of the earth being a sphere and why uh, the earth is heated unequally. We talked about the atmospheric physics of that. 
And um, now we're going to talk about the consequences of that, how the atmos how these atmospheric convention convection currents actually create glo global biomes. So as we look at this um, diagram down here, they've got a cool surface and a warm surface shown. Cool surfaces in blue, warm surfaces in red, and they're um, they're showing how. Um, the the warm light air rises here on this side. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not sure you can see red on red, right there, there. Yeah. So the um, as the incoming solar radiation warms um, the surface of the planet, we get a um, the air warms up. It becomes less dense. It goes up into the upper troposphere, um, and as it does that, it spreads out. Uh, and the reason it spreads out is because the Earth is spinning. Okay, and we're going to talk about that spreading out. That's actually part of what we call the Coriolis effect. But as it spreads out, it spreads, you know, both north and south, and it cools down. As it cools down, it sinks over here. And um, it actually creates kind of a, a, of a wind there as it falls back down to the planet, and the whole cycle starts again. Now, you don't need to know much too much about this low air pressure and high air pressure stuff. Um, we don't really get into weather in apes. Um, that's, not, that's not the focus here. But you do need to understand that um, this, this density difference, these convection currents, actually do create areas of high and low air pressure. And you're going to see that a little bit more as we get into, the, um, into these atmospheric convection currents a little bit deeper. Okay, so large atmospheric convection currents are found at specific locations on Earth. The first one that we're going to talk about is the Hadley cells. The Hadley cells cycle between zero degrees, zero degrees, which is the equator, and 30 degrees north and south latitude. So 30 degrees into the northern hemisphere and 30 degrees into the southern hemisphere. In a Hadley cell, the intense incoming solar radiation at the equator causes the air near the, near the surface to expand and rise. And if you can think back to our Earth Systems video, um, the, the sun's rays are very direct at the equator, so we have an intense incoming solar radiation. And um, the surface of the planet warms. It, uh, the, the, what's reflected is infrared heat that heats the air, that air that is now hot expands and it rises. The rising air cools down as it moves up into the troposphere um, and then it is condensed, so it undergoes adiabatic cooling. Those, the water falls back down in the tropics as rain. The cooler, drier air is then horizontally displaced. And that horizontal displacement is actually due to something called the Coriolis effect, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And that horizontally displaced cooler, drier air descends uh, back towards the surface at 30 degrees north and south latitude. So that 30 degree mark there, as this air sinks, as that air is sinking, adiabatic heating causes that air to warm up. So as a result, regions at 30 degrees north and south latitude are typically hot, dry desert biomes. Um, so this is an instance where, where um, a global biome is formed, and the reason it's formed where it is is because of atmospheric convection currents. Um, so the, the world's largest deserts are normally found along the 30 degrees north and south latitude um, area. The intertropical convergence zone, we call this the ITCZ, and that's how you'll see it um, throughout the course because it's kind of long to say intertropical convergence zone. It's the area near the equator that receives the most intense sunlight on Earth. The intense sunlight causes the ascending branches of the northern and southern Hadley cells to converge, and that is why it's called the intertropical convergence zone. I'm going to show you a picture um, on the next slide, so don't, don't freak out yet. So we've got two Hadley cells, and the Hadley cells, of course, they meet at that equator. So the ascending branches of those Hadley cells are meeting at the equator, and that is the intertropical convergence zone right there. The ITCZ is typified by dense clouds and intense thunderstorm activity. Now, ITCZ is not fixed. It's not directly at zero degrees um, all the time. Because the Earth is tilted, the ITCZ can move between zero and 23.5 degrees north latitude and zero and 23.5 degrees south latitude over the course of a year. So on the next slide, we're going to look at a picture of that. All right, so here we go. Here's the picture I promised. 
Intense sunlight near the equator causes the ascending branches of the two Hadley convection cells to converge. So let me make sure I've got my pen going. Take a look right here in the center. So if you see right here in the center, we're at the equator. We have equatorial low pressure there. Remember that at the equator, we have intense incoming solar radiation. It's the most direct and most intense on Earth. So that, that um, the air that's close to the surface is heating. As it heats, it rises and expands. And that's right here, it rises and expands. As it does that, it cools. As it cools, it is displaced to the north and it is displaced to the south, and that is due to the Coriolis effect. Again, don't freak out, we're gonna to get to that, we haven't gotten there yet. As it cools, cool dry air descends at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. There it is right there. That cool dry air undergoes adiabatic heating, and so the world's largest and most and driest deserts usually occur along the 30 degrees north and south latitude. Um, as is shown in this convection cell diagram. Okay, so the next cells that we're gonna talk about are the polar cells. Now, before we get to um, what the polar cells are, the Hadley cells, remember, are from the equator to 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. So now I'm gonna skip and I'm gonna talk about the polar cells. So we have skipped the mid-latitudes. I'm gonna come back to the mid-latitudes and the reason I skipped it, there's a reason I'm gonna skip it and, that, and that's, uh, we'll, we'll see that in the end, but we're gonna skip all the way to the poles. So we're moving from the equator to the poles. We're skipping over the mid-latitudes for a reason and we'll get there in just a sec. So the polar cells are formed from air that rises at 60 degrees north and south latitude and then sinks at 90 degrees south, uh, north and south latitude, which 90 degrees north and, north and south latitude are the poles. So again, it's the same kind of convection. We've got rising at a certain latitude and we've got sinking at another. So here we're rising at 60 degrees north and south and we're si sinking at, 60, at 90 degrees north and south, which are the poles. The warmer air at 60 degrees north and south latitude, which is the far northern limit of the mid-latitudes, rises, cools, and condenses exactly the same way that it would in a Hadley cell. The moisture from the condensed air is deposited, mostly as snow, in the subarctic and subantarctic regions. Then the cold, dry air sinks back to the surface at the poles at 90 degrees north and south latitude. The poles are cold and dry. And when we're talking about our biomes, when we're linking them to biome formation, the poles are considered the cold desert biome. They are cold and they are dry. That's the cold desert biome. So um, again, it's the exact same atmospheric mechanics that we see in a Hadley cell. We've got the rising at 60 and the sinking at 90. The rising is because of incoming solar radiation, which is heating up the planet, which then uh, radiates infrared radiation, which heats up the air. The air expands in, in um, it lowers the density, expands in volume. It rises into the troposphere. And as it does that, it condenses, it cools. It is horizontally displaced due to the Coriolis effect and it sinks back down at the poles. All right, so now we're going from the poles, we skipped from the equator, from the Hadley cells, to the poles. Now we're coming back to the mid-latitudes. The mid-latitude cells are called feral cells, okay? They lie between the Hadley at the equator and 30 degrees north and south and the polar, which are 60 degrees north and south to 90 degrees north and south. Um, so again, feral cells are found between 30 degrees north and south and 60 degrees north and south. They are considered mid-latitude cells. Most of the United States and most of Europe, I, that's not in the PowerPoint, but uh, you can think, we think about your latitudes. So most of the U.S. and most of your, uh, Europe is under the influence of the northern hemisphere feral cell. Feral cell circulation is not as strong as Hadley cell circulation and not as strong as polar cell circulation. And the reason we skipped it and we did Hadley first and polar first was because the feral cells are largely influenced by the very strong circulations of the Hadleys and Polars. So the circulation of feral cells is less well-defined, which means that the wind currents in the mid-latitudes are also quite variable. 
So whereas we have very, very strong convection currents with a very strong rising at the equator, a very strong sinking at 30 degrees north and south, a very strong rising at 60 degrees north and south, and a very strong sinking at 90 degrees north and south, the mid-latitude cells, those feral cells, are not super well-defined. And they actually um, have some variability and they're influenced heavily by the Hadley and the polar cells. So we do those last because... Um, because they're 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 not as well defined, and because uh, the circulation currents are um, are largely dependent on the other two types of uh, stronger convection cells. All right, so here is a picture. Um, this is the Earth, uh, obviously, and I have put some labels here around the side. Um, this is the tricellular model of atmospheric circulation. So what we've been talking about, uh, let's break that down. Tricellular, tri means three, cellular means cells. And so we're talking about the Hadley cells. There they are right there. The feral cells and the polar cells. And you can see that, of course, they are present north and south latitudes. Um, you guys already know Hadley cells are from the equator to 30 degrees north and south. Feral cells are 30 degrees north and south to 60 degrees north and south. And polar are from 60, to 60 north and south to 90 north and south. The cells are formed due to the uneven heating of the earth by the sun. And even though there's only one half that's filled in here, those cells are mirrored on this half of the earth as well obviously. Um, they didn't draw them all in, but they are, they're, they, are, they are mirrored on the opposite side as well. So these are the cells um, and, and what they look like. Um, and then this area right here where we have our ascending branches of the Halley cells is our ITCZ. Okay. All right, the Coriolis effect. You've heard me actually say those words several times, and I told you that we would get to that so that you would understand what that is. So differential heating of the earth by the sun causes those convection currents to form directly above the surface. So this is the cells that we've been talking about. However, the rising air is deflected off a straight northerly or southerly path because the earth is rotating, the earth is spinning. The deflection of those currents is called the Coriolis effect. So this is, this is something is, is that actually links back to atmospheric physics. And if you've taken physics, you've probably actually gotten to see a deflection or a force deflection table in action, maybe as a demo. So when an, when an object is spinning, like the earth, or in the case of physics, if you saw a demonstration, this would be like a spinning turntable, and you drop something on it, you get a deflection of that object. Uh, and the deflection can be either to the right or to the left, depending on where the object is dropped. So objects in the northern hemisphere are deflected to the right. Objects in the southern hemisphere are deflected to the left. They're deflected off their straight, either northerly path or southerly path, depending uh, what, if it's in the northern hemisphere, they're deflected to the right. If it's in the southern hemisphere, they're deflected to the left. The Coriolis effect occurs because the equator of the Earth, now again, picture the Earth, it's a sphere. The equator is actually spinning faster than the poles. So that doesn't make sense to our brains, so let's break it down. At the equator, the circumference of the Earth is about 40,000 kilometers. I think I might have an extra zero in there. Yep. Um, there's an extra zero right there. We're going to cross out that zero, and I'll fix that in just a, when, when I upload it again. But the, at, the, at the circumference of the Earth at the equator is 40,000 kilometers. But at the poles, it's only 7,000 kilometers. So the, 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 the width, the girth, right, the circumference of the Earth is wider at the equator. And you would know that if you thought about you know, what, a, what a sphere looks like. This means that the surface of the Earth is moving 1,670 kilometers at the equator, but it's moving slower. It's only moving 291 kilometers per hour near the poles. It has to move quicker at the equator than at the poles in order for the entire sphere to spin together. The Coriolis effect is also responsible for Earth's distinctive prevailing wind patterns. And we're going to talk more about the prevailing winds when we talk about the El Nino Southern Oscill um, Oscillation. So 
Again, um, the Coriolis effect, the, the, this deflection is the result of the spinning of the Earth, and um, the spinning is faster at the equator than it is at the poles, and that is because the Earth is a sphere, and it's larger at the equator than it is at the poles. Okay, so um, there's a lot going on, and I, I frequently say that about these diagrams, but there's a lot going on here, so we're going to break it down. So we have got atmospheric uh, circulation cells shown here along with prevailing winds. So let's take this little by little. So here's um, our equatorial trough. It's our low pressure belt. Um, you don't really need to about, know about the doldrums, uh, but th that's, that's the intertropical convergence zone, right? Which we've talked about several times. It's the ascending branches of those Hadley cells right at the equator. And then as we move right up from the equator, this way, up towards the pole, North Pole and South Pole, as we move from the equator, we've got our tropical cells, which we call Hadley cells. Um, then we get our mid-latitude feral cells, and we get our northerly polar cells. So those are the, the atmospheric cells that are, that are sitting on top, right? That, that's the kind of the overlay. And you can see, if you look right in this area, this is the cutaway. Um, they're trying to show that those cells kind of wrap around. So they've cut away in this, in this middle part area so that you can see what's underneath there. Um, over here... On the left-hand side, we've got our prevailing winds. So we've got westerlies, southeasterly trades, northeasterly trades, and again, westerlies. So we've got southern westerlies and northern westerlies, southeasterly trades, which are in the southern hemisphere, northeasterly trades. And those are actually driven by the Coriolis effect and these convection cells. So um, again, you can see that some of these areas are, uh, are shown in reddish orange and some are shown in blue. And that is showing uh, warm air rising and cool air descending. And you notice that they look kind of diagonal, right? Um, the, the kind of, the, the way that these are shaped looks a little bit diagonal. And again, that is due to the, to, due to the deflection from the Coriolis effect. Um, so when, if you were you know, mapping these, I'm actually mapping uh, right now with my pen. I'm showing you the arrows. And sometimes if you look at diagrams, in fact, the one that you look at in your book shows these as arrows. This is deflection to the right and to the left in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere um, based upon uh, the Coriolis effect here. Now, again, you can see um, these, these trade winds that are coming across. They actually have quite a bit to do with uh, the blowing of um, surface currents in the ocean, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. All right, air moving inland from the water often causes, uh, often contains large amounts of water vapor. And that makes sense, right? So you have water that's over, um, over a body of water. As that water moves inland from above the body of water, it has large amounts of water vapor in it. When this um, air that contains a large amount of water vapor meets the windward side of a mountain, uh, the windward side is the side that's facing the prevailing winds. The air rises and undergoes adiabatic cooling. So picture in your mind an ocean, okay? There's air above the ocean. As that air, which contains a lot of moisture, uh, moves inland, if there is a mountain range close to the shore, it's gonna rise. Why does it rise? Well, because it's hitting a mountain range. As it rises, it undergoes adiabatic cooling. Um, with this adiabatic cooling, clouds form, precipitation falls on the windward side of the range, okay? So the cold, dry air, now of course the air has now lost all its moisture, it's up in the upper troposphere, the air is now cold and dry. It is displaced, again due to the Coriolis effect, and it travels due to this displacement due to the leeward side of the range. The leeward side, right here, is the side that's opposite the prevailing winds. Okay, so again, think about a mountain range. You've got a side that's close to the prevailing winds and a side that's away. Now the air has now risen into the troposphere. It's dropped all its moisture on the windward side. The air is now on the leeward side. As it sinks down, it undergoes adiabatic heating. So the windward sides of mountain ranges close to large bodies of water tend to be very moist and very lush but the leeward sides of mountain ranges close to large bodies of water tends to be very arid and devoid of vegetation. This is what we call the rain shadow effect. 
rain shadow, okay? The rain shadow is exactly what we just described. It's the, uh, the movement of, of water, uh, air with large amounts of water vapor inland. It rises, undergoes adiabatic cooling, drops its moisture. On the leeward side, you've got cold, dry air that undergoes adiabatic heating. And so you get very, very different, um, what we would consider microbiomes on the windward side of a mountain range versus the leeward side. And again, here is a um, diagram of what a rain shadow looks like. And this is what I asked you to picture in your mind. Here's the ocean or the sea. Um, the, the air above this uh, contains large amounts of water vapor. As it hits the coastal mountain range, it rises into the troposphere, it condenses and it loses its moisture. This is called adiabatic cooling. As the air is displaced horizontally due to the Coriolis effect, the air is moving this way. And on the leeward side here, you have the um, cold, dry air descending, undergoing adiabatic heating, and you get dry air descending, warmer, drier air descending here. So you get um, desert-like conditions on the leeward side and very warm, moist conditions on the windward side. This is the rain shadow effect. Okay, let's talk about ocean currents. The flow of ocean water influences climate because it moves warm and cold water to different parts of the earth. So um, ocean currents are driven by a combination of, put your thinking caps on because this is a lot, temperature, gravity, prevailing winds, the Coriolis effect, salinity, and the locations of continents. All right, so there was a, this is a very, very complex system, and we can kind of outline the, the general parameters of oceanic currents, but they're very, very complex, and there's a lot of factors um, that drive them. Warm water, like warm air, expands and rises. Tropical waters, those near the equator, are about three inches higher than mid-latitude wa waters. I don't know if you can picture this in your mind, but water at the equator is actually higher than water in mid-latitudes. And this actually causes water to flow away from the equator due to gravity. Uh, most people don't think about this, but water at the poles is actually higher and it flows away from the equator due to the force of gravity because that water is, has expanded um, because it's warmer. The flow of water away from the equator combined with the other forces that we were talking about, uh, prevailing winds, Coriolis effects, salinity, locations of continents, uh, makes the surface waters circulate. Let's talk about the gyres. Gyres are large scale patterns of water circulation that move clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Gyres redistribute heat in the ocean, just as atmospheric convection currents redistribute heat in the atmosphere. There are actually five gyres um, in the oceans, and I'm not 100% sure that this, um, this projection actually shows all five of them, but you can see some of them here. Okay, so here we've got the North Pacific gyre here. We've got the North Atlantic gyre here. Got the South Pacific Gyre, South Atlantic Gyre, Indian Ocean Gyre, one, two, three, four. That's all five of them. There we go. So um, we're going to be talking about gyres quite a bit. Um, this, the, we've got some the, gyres are like uh, they're, they're actually spinning currents in these areas, and you can kind of see that they'll sh they show you right here warm and cold. So you've got warm and cold currents that are coming together, and they create a little bit of a large scale spin area, and they help to redistribute heat, obviously, but um, they also tend to trap a lot of the plastic pollution that's in the oceans. And so when you're looking for um, a lot of plastic pollutions, normally at the center of each of these gyres, you end up with a large amount of plastic pollution because uh, they actually kind of scoop, as they're moving around, they actually kind of scoop up a lot of plastic pollution. So um, gyres can be very important when we look at uh, in terms of plastic pollution, kind of the health of the oceans, like what's at the center of these gyres, how much plastic pollution are we seeing? And we're gonna be, um, we're gonna be talking about uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is in the center of one of these gyres. 
Global thermohaline circulation is the sinking of dense salty water in the North Atlantic that drives a deep cold current that moves slowly around the world. Um, thermo means heat, haline means salt. So this is temperature and salt circulation, and that's exactly what it's based on. It's based on warm and cold and different levels of salinity. So the warmer water is usually surface water. Surface water is usually less salty and less dense. Um, water that's down further in the ocean tends to be saltier, denser, and colder. So these density differences and these salinity differences actually cause um, these, these very deep, slow currents that redist redistribute heat uh, around the globe. Thermohaline circulation drives the mixing of warmer surface waters and colder, deeper waters, and it's absolutely crucial for redistributing heat and nutrients from the equator to the poles and from the poles to the equator. Um, we, in recent years, have had a little bit of um, anxiety about global thermohaline circulation. We're concerned that global warming can actually alter this very deep, very slow circulation pattern. And here's why. As global warming continues, the accelerated melting of the glaciers in the Northern Hemisphere may cause the North Atlantic to decrease in salinity. So if you have an influx of fresh water from the melting glaciers, then you have a decrease in salinity. When the salinity decreases, the water is less dense and thus it's less likely to sink. If it's less likely to sink, then thermohaline circulation in the North Atlantic can shut down and that particular part of that conveyor, of that global thermine global thermohaline conveyor is really, really essential at heat distribution. So global warming um, can have a pretty serious effect on this global um, thermohaline circulation, and we're keeping a very close eye on it for that reason. Here's a good picture of it. Um, and again, it kind of, to me, looks like a, a ribbon, and there's, there's some intricacies that are not shown on this particular graph. Uh, in particular, the, the actual currents come in a lot closer right here um, into this, this area, this dip in North America. But the North Atlantic that we're talking about is right here. Um, this, this is what we're concerned about. These glaciers that are up here are melting right there. And as they melt, and of course there's glaciers all up here in Canada as well, as those glaciers melt, they're putting fresh water into the North Atlantic. This, this water is losing its uh, salinity, and so it's becoming uh, lighter, denser, and less, less salty. Well, when that happens, we don't get the sinking that we should see right in this area here. So instead of this rising along the coast of Europe, which is bringing the heat, which keeps Europe from having an ice age, um, we end up with this circulation pattern right here in the North Atlantic shutting down. Uh, that could throw Europe into an ice age, and uh, all of the upwelling due to the nutrients here uh, could, be, could be completely disrupted due to the melting glaciers as a direct consequence of global warming. All right, so I mentioned the term upwelling in the last slide that I talked about. Upwelling is the upward movement of deep cold ocean waters. It usually um, it happens along the west coast of continents, and this results from thermohaline circulation. I'm just gonna go ahead and circle these areas, um, and we're gonna be talking about this area in particular. We're about to talk about the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and this area is influenced by that. You can see that these are along the west coast of continents, and we get cold water upwelling here. Um, this is very, very deep ocean water that comes up from um, the, the, the bottom layers of the ocean up along the west coast of continents. And when it does that, it brings these deep nutrients with it, which supports a, um, a large plethora of fish and aquatic life. Um, when these are disrupted by either the El Nino event, which we're about to talk about, or um, some, other, some other type of event, um, we have a lack of upwelling and fishing can dis get disrupted. And we also have um, influences in local weather patterns. So the El Nino Southern Oscillation, we call this the ENSO, E-N-S-O. It is periodic. It is non-anthropogenic. Okay, and this is, this is frequently screwed up by kids. So when I say non-anthropogenic, I mean that the, the, um, the ENSO is not caused by man. Okay, 
It is a reversal in the prevailing winds and tropical surface currents in the Southern Pacific Ocean. So the prevailing winds normally blow a certain way and you're about to see a diagram. Well, when that reverses and the prevailing winds blow the opposite way, it, the surface currents do not move the way that they normally do and you have a reversal of these, um, these, these ocean currents. It occurs every three to seven years. Again, it's periodic and it's not caused by man. It's a normal uh, earth cycle variation. Normally the, the ENSO begins about December 25th and that's where it gets its name. So El Nino in Spanish is, uh, means the little boy, it's short for the Christ child. And they, they named it that because this phenomenon begins around Christmas. So it's called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. ENSO weakens or stops upwelling along the South American West Coast, which I just showed you in the, the previous map which decreases primary productivity and it reduces fish populations. It brings cooler, wetter weather to the United States and drought, which is often accompanied by wildfires, to Australia, Southeast Asia, and Southern Africa. And I'm about to show you a diagram of that. Okay, so here's our ENSO, our El Nino Southern Oscillation Diagram. So right over here, are our normal conditions. Um, normal conditions are sometimes referred to as La Nina, so don't be surprised if you hear that. Sometimes those are referred to as La Nina conditions. So let's get our bearings here. This is Australia. I want you to picture the Pacific Ocean, the Southern Pacific Ocean. So here we see the coast of Australia. Here we see the coast of South America. I want you to think back to the upwelling map that I showed you. Along this coast of South America, we normally get a very, very, very strong thermocline where we get an upwelling along that coastal area. That upwelling be brings cold, nutrient-rich waters um, to the, the, the western coast of South America, which supports a very, very um, rich fishing industry. You can see that these red, arrows um, are the surface currents and the surface winds are normally blowing across South America, across, and they're blowing across the, the Southern Pacific Ocean. Those winds come down off South America and they push that warm surface water across towards Australia, which brings up that cold, deep water. As the surface waters that are warm are displaced, the colder waters well up along that coast. So the warm waters are pushed westward and those colder waters uh, move up from the deeper depths and are replaced. Now in an El Nino condition, we have a reversal of that. So notice where the red arrows are. The red arrows are indicative of the surface currents and the orange arrows up here are indicative of the, the prevailing winds. So we have a weakening of the prevailing winds coming off, off of South America. The winds weaken. There, there it is, I just circled it. The winds weaken, the prevailing winds weaken, and so they're not strong enough to push those surface currents across westerly towards Australia. So we get this, we get a um, kind of almost like a mini convection cell action going here, and we those weak winds are not pushing that warm water. So our surface currents actually begin to move from Australia towards South America. The warm water flow is stopped. Sometimes it's even reversed. And because we do not have the vacating of the warm surface water, we can't have the upwelling. So the warm water does not up, I mean, excuse me, the cold water does not upwell along the South American coast. Um, when this happens, number one, it devastates fisheries. So because the nutrients are not being not bring, coming to the South American coast, the fish aren't coming to the South American, co American coast. So the fishermen are losing their livelihood because the fish aren't there. The other things that happens is we've got this little convection cell that's occurring here, and we've got a convection cell that's occurring here. Now these are micro cells, these aren't macro cells. But because of this, um, this winds weaken causing updrafts and storms along the coast of South America, we actually get really, really heavy rainstorms that are coming down into that area right here, which is normally a dry area, which causes flooding and landslides along the west coast of South America. And over here, right, we end up with drought because, then there, there, I kind of wrote over it, we end up with drought because the rain is actually falling over the ocean instead of making it all the way to Australia. We don't actually get the precipitation where it needs to be. If you compare 
uh, the El Nino where the cloud is over here. It's much, much, much further to the west in this as it, as it is here. So we're getting precipitation over the ocean, which is not helping Southeast Asia and Australia. So Australia ends up being very dry. Um, you know, we end up with wildfires. Um, oftentimes, Australia often burns in El Nino years. Um, and we end up with uh, excess precipitation and landslides in South America, no upwelling, and um, a lack of nutrients bringing to that coast.